Mm -hmm. so, um, welcome everybody to uh, Arizona PowerShell Users Group for March. Today we're lucky enough to have somebody for, all the way from Australia that lives in Toronto, right? Yeah, that's right. Yep. Okay. Um, he'll be presenting today for Octopus with uh, PowerShell. Um, for those of you that do or don't know, I cut a lot of my PowerShell teeth on Octopus early on, about two, three, four years ago, something like that. So it influenced me quite a bit and with regards to how I script now and that kind of thing. So with that, what I'd like to do is hand over the floor to the folks from Tech Systems since they've been kind enough to uh, buy our dinner. Um, uh, Damien, we'll send you a picture of it. <laughs> All right, all right. <laughs> well, that's the best we can do for the moment, but... That's fine. They've been kind enough to uh, not only bring us food and water, but also have a, a great facility for us to use. So. Yeah, we'll leave the floor to you. It's our pleasure. Love seeing you guys. Definitely some familiar faces, a uh, few new faces, so that's good too. Um, tech systems, if you're not familiar with us, we do IT staffing and services across the whole country. So even if you're looking to relocate, we have over 100 offices nationwide. Um, Brett, even my, in Toronto. In Toronto as well, yeah. <laughs> um, this is my colleague Brett. He works in our north office, so that will be on Camelback in 32nd. Um, so just thought it'd be good to bring another, you know, source in here for you guys if you're looking for lo like positions that are located up north. Um, this south office, obviously, a little more southern stuff, but um, don't want to take too much of your time. Let you guys get into the talk, and then we'll leave some business cards for you up here. Um, so if you guys do have any questions or curiosities, or just want to get an update on some market trends in the valley, or um, like average salary range for someone with your skill set, anything like that. So we could definitely um, help you out and look forward to hearing. From you. Yeah, like I said, I'm out the the north side, so I deal with a lot of our, all of our customers. We kind of split the the city in half between this office and our north office uh, through kind of like the 20210 kind of range. So a lot of our uh, big customers are through Safeway, actually the state here, uh, APS uh, that we've been dealing with. So um, uh, I think we've worked a little bit with CBS in the past, not so much anymore. Uh, my Scott Sale boy over here. Uh, I feel like I'm just kind of. Uh, but yeah, it, like you said, Nick's a great contact for, for down here. And if you guys have questions on the rest of the I'd love to help you guys any way you need. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. So I think we're not really Thanks. supposed to Thank schedule you. start about, what, 10 minutes, right? Yeah. That's what you got to set up for. So, Damon, are you cool with waiting just a little bit longer since we're almost over our technical problems? Yeah, no problem at all. I'm uh, just running a demo end to end just to make sure that Microsoft hasn't turned off Visual Studio or something. Um, okay, sounds good, man. Are we ready to start? You ready, Oliver? You're ready. Okay. So um, again, welcome everybody to March for uh, Arizona PowerShell. Um, today we have Damian Brady from Octopus Deploy, who's a company a company out of uh, Australia. So um, Damian. Uh, you, the floor is yours, so whenever you're ready. Okay, cool. Um, well, maybe I'll start by sharing a screen. Um, Here, I'll, I'll give you a slow pan around the room so you can see everybody. Okay. Yep. So see, there's about 10 or 12 of us in here. Okay. Here's that guy you've been talking to or working with right there. Oh, yeah. Awesome. I may respond to you 30 seconds later as I'm listening to the video. All right. Cool. All right. Yeah, it went dark, dude. I shouldn't play with things, especially if you're mine. So, are you all seeing yourself, yourselves at the moment? Yes. All right. Let me see if I can fix that. How's that? Is that working? Awesome. That's it. Awesome. Well, cool. Ah, all right. Hold on. Nope, wrong one. Hi, America. <laughs> okay, that's that's later. That's a surprise. Oh. Um, okay. <laughs> all right. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, even remotely as well. It's it's always good to do these things, especially if I can't get to the place or if it's a little bit um infeasible to get to get out there. Um. So yes. Uh, as was said earlier, I work for a company called Octopus Deploy. Um, 
it's my details there or as many as you need probably and um uh and i yeah i come from a place called australia about 45 minutes north of where this photo is taken actually so we tend to uh, i do surf and when we surf we tend to drive a little bit further south maybe an hour south of this because this is a very clicky beach and you'll get chased off waves and punched and things like that um but there's yeah there's a lot of this kind of stuff but about um christmas eve this year last year sorry we moved to toronto in canada um except it was winter so it was a bit more like canada um <laughs> which was interesting because we'd never really seen that before um the coldest it gets in, and I'm gonna I'm gonna run into the Fahrenheit thing again. But the coldest it gets in Brisbane, where we're from, in the depths of winter, you might get down close to zero degrees Celsius, so close to 32 Fahrenheit. Um, but you, that's very very rare. Um, by contrast, when we arrived here, Queensland um, or Brisbane, where I'm from, was constantly hitting about 35 degrees Celsius during the day. So you're kind of getting close to 100 during the day. And in a few cases, it was about that in the middle of the night too. So I wasn't really wishing I was home at that point either. But um, yeah, this was definitely a, a change for me. So yeah, we basically flew all the way from Brisbane, about as far as you can get uh, in one flight, although we did take three. And it was about 20... 25 28 hours on a on a plane which is a lot but um if you ever go between australia and the us that's just what you're gonna have to do um so i more or less traded vegemite and drop bears for maple syrup and real bears <laughs> which which are both much safer actually <laughs> so, yeah so quite a move um i'm enjoying it so far and and i am getting down to the us a couple of times uh for some conferences uh, hopefully, Kansas City Dev Conference, um, VS Live in Austin, uh, OzCon in Austin, and Orlando, Florida. So those are the ones I've got lined up, um, and hopefully some a bit closer to you guys if they're if they're up there. So if there are things you need you think I should go to, let me know. All right, it's enough about me. That's not really why you're here. You're here to to listen to. Um, to Octopus Deploy for PowerShell users. So a little bit of a disclaimer, I'm not a great PowerShell guy. I do write a lot of PowerShell and luckily Google knows PowerShell quite well. So that's generally how I'll write my, write my scripts. But I am gonna show you a few different things. Uh, so we're gonna look at briefly about Octopus for those who don't know Octopus. Actually, maybe that's a, that's a interesting point. How many people do actually know Octopus deploy already first see some hands one <laughs> one and i assume all of the hidden people as well okay um all right well i'll go very quickly through what octopus deploy is um first we'll do a demo uh and then we'll talk about how you use scripts in octopus deploy and i'll focus on powershell but um you can actually use script cs f sharp or bash depending on where you're deploying to and what your preference is uh, we'll have a look at the conventions uh, using scripts by convention in Octopus as well, which can be really handy. Uh, we'll have a look at the script console, which for um, operations people can be incredibly useful. Um, we'll have a look at some new features like uh, custom health checks. And I'll also touch briefly on PowerShell DSC, which is kind of the, the um, infrastructure as code side of DevOps that, that is pretty popular at the moment. So first up, uh, where Octopus fits. So usually I'm talking about Octopus in front of other developers. So I come from a development background rather than operations background. So developers tend to use Octopus to deploy their software. Basically Octopus is a deployment automation tool that helps you get your code into production um, via all of your other environments. So the way that the general cycle works for developers is that developers will make a change. They'll commit that change and push it to wherever they need to push it to. Um, Visual Studio Team Services I tend to use, uh, which you probably would have seen a lot of if you watched the VS launch <laughs> today as well. Um, and then as part of the build that happens, um, it's, it's compiled and put into a package. 
Now, traditionally, Octopus used to use NuGet packages and still does, and that's kind of our preferred package format. Uh, NuGet packages are usually used in development uh, as libraries of, of things that you want to use. So you add a NuGet package like json.net, for example, and then you get all the libraries that are required to parse JSON. Um, we use the format, though, because ultimately it's just a zip file with some extra metadata. So that means that you can zip up all of the artifacts that get built, all of the compiled assemblies, and then version it. So the metadata just has a versioning number on it. So ultimately, it's just a zip file with some versioning on it. We also now support zip files themselves, and the version number is just in the file name, uh, as well as tarballs if you're using Linux as well. Right, so we've pushed our code, we've built it, and then we've packaged it up into this zip file or into a NuGet file. Then we push it to Octopus. And so Octopus really is treated here as an artifact repository. So you're saying, here's all my code and the built, uh, the compiled code that I have, and giving it to, Oct to Octopus as a version of your application. Now, you don't have to push it to Octopus, by the way. You can use another NuGet package feed or even a file system, like a folder. Uh, Octopus will deal with them as well. Um, and we also support uh, a little bit beyond the scope of this talk, but we also support um, Docker, uh, uh, Docker. what are they called? Hubs, images, image repositories, that kind of thing. So you can push a Docker image as well and get Octopus to read that Docker image. So in Octopus though, um, the, main, uh, the main thing that it does is coordinate your deployment. So you have this package, but you need to tell Octopus how to deploy this package. So what steps are required? And it might be as simple as just copying some files into a folder in a, uh, on a machine, or it might be pushing a website to Azure, or it might be a whole lot of other steps to do with you know, sending out email notifications or uh, configuring IIS, running services, restarting machines, all sorts of stuff. So Octopus, once you configure it, knows how to do this with this package that you've given it. So once you've pushed the package to Octopus, you can tell Octopus to create a release. And a release is basically a snapshot, not just of the files that you want to deploy, so the package that you want to deploy, but also the steps that you're going to take to deploy that package. And I'll show you that in a sec. Once you've created a release, this snapshot, here's the version and the steps by which I need to deploy, then you can deploy it to a test environment. And then once you've verified that that's okay, you deploy it to a production environment. Now, the important thing here is that it's the same package. So any dependencies are external. So if you have a connection string to a database, for example, that should be in an external file. And Octopus can manage that configuration um, however, however you see fit. There's a few things built in where it knows how to do, uh, knows how to do config file transforms and file replacements and uh, token replacements and things like that. I'll show you that in a little bit. So the idea here is all of this happens automatically once you've configured it. So when you, once you make a change to your code and push it to your source control repository, a build runs, which might have tests in it, it gets packaged up, pushed to Octopus, Octopus creates a release, deploys to your test environment. If you're really brave, you can get it to automatically deploy to production once that testing's happened, or you can click a button and deploy to production as well. So Octopus really lives in this area of that of that life cycle. Um, there's also a few things you can do, like magic stuff to build up machines, and we'll touch on that briefly at the end with the DSC stuff. Um, but for the most part, for the demos I'm gonna show you, I'm just gonna assume that these machines already exist, our test machine already exists, and our production machine already exists. All right, so that, that was a little bit, especially if um, day to day you don't do uh, software development. Um, any questions about that process? Because it's kind of important. I want to show you it working, but um, it's it's important to understand where that fits, really. How do you license? How do we license? Um, so the licensing is, um, it's actually free for small teams. So if your team is uh, less than five people, you have less than five projects and you're deploying to less than 10 environments or um, approximately that then it's just free. Um, beyond that, it's licensed based on those three metrics. So the number of users, number of projects that you have in Octopus, and the number of deployments. 
So the licensing goes from, I think, 700 US dollars for 2020 20 and 20, so 20 users, 20 projects, 20 targets, uh, to I think it's 2000 US for 50, 50, 50, and then, or might be 60. And then the next step is 5000 US and it's unlimited. So that, that price is kind of 50% um, license cost and 50% maintenance. So it's a perpetual license. You can buy it once and then never upgrade again if you don't want to. But included in that money is a year's worth of maintenance, so upgrades and support. And then if you want to renew, it's basically half the, half the cost again. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yes, thank you very much. How does your product uh, compare to like SMS or Uniplug? So my, uh, that's a good question. So, um, S uh, so SMS is that um, more for infrastructure management or is it for it's software? packages? You know, it does the same. Okay. Um, I don't know those two products. Is the short answer? <laughs> um, it it more closely compares, I guess, with. Um, release management from Microsoft. So it's it's less about the infrastructure and about monitoring what's in production, although that's probably going to change a little bit soon, and more about um, running these steps to deploy your, your code to particular environments and coordinating that across multiple machines and uh, web farms and, and things like that. It might answer the question a little bit if I show you it in operation as well. Um, yeah. Cool. So, any any th last things just before I move on to the demo? Have you messed with TFS at all? The yeah, release yeah, portion of it? it. It's um, so. Imagine um, two years ago when I worked out with Octopus Deploy, it was um, where TFS release management is right now, and they're at the two years ago they were light years ahead of release management. So it's very very similar in that. It can do um, all the release portion of what your best would do very well, very well. So a strategy really there, um, they have been playing catch up a little bit, release management, and they are catching up a fair bit. Um, I mean, they have they have an unlimited pile of money, Microsoft, right? So they, they are catching us a bit, but our strategy with that is really just to focus on the product rather than focusing on um, the competitor, I suppose. So, um, because that is um, .NET, right? Uh, Octopus, it's primarily .NET, yeah, but we've started um, spreading out a little bit. So, um, I don't have a demo working at the moment, but you can also deploy uh, Node quite easily to Linux boxes. You can deploy to Azure. Basically, anything you you can script with PowerShell, uh, Script CS. Uh, F sharp or bash, or even if you have your own tools, you can do it with Octopus. It's ultimately, you know, if you can run it on a command line somewhere, then you can deploy it. All right. Um, another question. So, <laughs> sure. Can, they, um, can, they, can it do any kind of drip reporting between the environments and like the configuration files? Uh, it can. So, this is something we've only just started touching on. Um, yeah. And yeah, when we get to the DSC stuff at the end, I can show you. Um, actually, just before that, there's a health check um, demo that I'm going to show you as well. And you can use that to, to do your drift detection. But uh, ultimately, right at the moment, the focus is on deploying the application and making sure that that's a repeatable process across your environments. We are pushing further into that monitoring. Because ultimately, if, if Octopus knows how to deploy your website to a box that has IIS running, for example, it knows where it's deployed that, and it can monitor what's happening to feed that back and say, hey, look, this looks like it's unhealthy. Do you want to redeploy it? Now, at the moment, you can do that stuff with Octopus. It's a little bit fiddly at the moment, but we're, we're definitely working to make that a lot easier than it was. All right, and you're going to get us the pricing structure so we have an idea what this costs. Yeah, uh, in fact, I can probably do that now if you like. Hold on. Um, sorry, I'm on my other screen at the moment. There we go. So um, it defaults to the enterprise one. So. Yeah, um, 
So yeah, enterprise that's that's unlimited users, unlimited projects, unlimited target machines, and so on. Do we? Yeah. What was that? Sorry. One year support. Yes. Yep. One year support and maintenance. So if you wanted to extend that to two years, for example, it adds half on again. So half of that um, amount is maintenance. So on an ongoing basis, um, you can do that. However, it is a perpetual license. So if you decide you don't want to upgrade it, then you can just stay on the original one and not uh, and not pay that extra maintenance. So this 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 software can show me the difference. I can. Like if I had 800 servers, it could show me the difference between the environment and let's say the Apache Tomcat configuration file. Uh, if I wanted to pull some values out of that file over a bunch of servers in each environment, it could do that for me? It can, and that's, that's a demo I've got a little bit later on as well um, with the script console. So the, it's not... So the product itself, I should be clear, um, isn't really focused around monitoring servers and making sure they're all running the right things. It's more around running the steps to deploy your application uh, across a fleet of servers with different roles and so on. But we are starting to delve a little bit more into, uh, uh, into what you're talking about. So at the moment, yes, you can do it, but it takes a little bit of your own scripting and a little bit of your own, um, your own ingenuity right now. But I'll show you. I'll show you that stuff when we get to the uh, the console and the health check and things like that. Cool. All right. Let's have. Oh, uh, sorry. There's one more thing that I probably should mention as well, and this is really to do with how Octopus itself um, communicates. So, um, if you've managed like fleets of servers before, which I'm sure um, many of you have. Uh, Managing them all individually and, and running these steps across all of the servers can be a little bit tricky, even from a just a, a security perspective. Having a domain account where you can do um, remote PowerShell across a bunch of servers outside of DMZ and all that sort of stuff is a bit tricky. Um, so you have an Octopus server um, and then a bunch of uh, target machines. So in this in this little diagram, we've got two web servers and an app server. Now each of these servers has a little agent running on it, which we call a tentacle. So the Octopus server manages all of the tentacles. Now, each of these components, the server and the tentacle, have their own thumbprint. So it's ultimately just an X509 certificate, so a self-signed um, security certificate. And then to manage the communication between them, the server and the tentacle establish a connection giving, given those thumbprints out of band. So you basically tell Octopus, hey, here's the, here's the um, the tentacle I want you to connect to, and the tentacle knows the thumbprint of the server it's allowed to talk to as well. So you do that for each of them. So each of these targets has an independent connection to the Octopus server, and that connection is basically secured with um, mutual certificates. So each side has a certificate, and the communication gets wrapped up. Ultimately, it's just TLS or SSL um, doing that communication. Now, the other big advantage here is that the target um, the, the technical agents that run on these target machines, they can run as local accounts. And in fact, by default, when you install them, they run as, as a uh, local system account. So what that means is the instructions can come from the Octopus server just over SSL, <coughs> over um, just a standard um, port. And then the instructions actually get executed by an agent that's running as a local account. Now, you can obviously restrict that account so it only has access to do certain things, but it kind of rids you this idea of having a domain account that needs access to all of these different machines so you can run these things remotely. So when the operations actually take place, it's the local account that's running those operations and then logs and data and things flow back over that same connection back to the Octopus server. So does that, does that make sense as well? That's kind of one of the key... Um, selling points, I think, of, of Octopus over, especially release management at the moment, but over uh, some other tools as well. That communication mechanism is done without the help of, um, of domain accounts and, and things like that. So it uses a self-signed certificate and it does not use domain accounts, correct? Correct, yes. It actually I mean, works under the local system context. Yes. Uh, 
Yeah. And I mean, it can run under any account that you can set that service to. So the, the technical agents run as a Windows service, ultimately. And so they will run under whatever account you, um, you set up. And for Unix, what, what do they run under? Just what was that, sorry? For Unix, then? What, oh, for, you, for Linux? I'm getting it. Okay. Right. Yeah, for Linux. Okay. Yes. So for, for Linux, um, the communication is just done over an SSH okay. connection. Yep. So uh, the way that it works with Linux right now is that, um, that this communication here is just done over an SSH connection. Um, and then as part of that, uh, the Octopus server sends down an executable, which is called Calamari, which um, we, we love our kind of octopus analogies here. We basically we basically cut up this tentacle agent into the communication thing, which is still the tentacle. So basically it's just a communication shell and then Calamari, which does all the work. So Calamari still gets sent down the wire to the Linux box. So it knows how to run the commands that it's being given over SSH. But that, that Calamari um, file is actually sent over the SSH connection anyway. Um, pretty recently we've added support for Calamari-less um, deployments as well. So you don't actually need that Calamari agent because at the moment it's still dependent on Mono. And if anybody's tried to install Mono on Linux boxes, um, usually that's the hardest part of deploying to Linux using Octopus is installing Mono. So uh, we're trying to remove ourselves from that as well. And uh, .NET Core is definitely going to be helping us along the way. So we'll have Calamari running in .NET Core um, very, very soon, I think. Can you use domain issued certificates instead of self-signed? You can, yeah. So you can you can replace that certificate with whichever certificate you want. This is um it's actually something we pushed back on for a little bit until we realized that people just wanted to do it anyway. We had a lot of um a lot of people requesting that uh, they replace all of these certificates with um uh, some provided by certificate authorities, which is fine. Um. But yeah, for a while we were we were pushing back on it on a on the grounds of well it doesn't actually make anything more secure. But um, I think we lost that battle to be honest. So yes, you can replace these certificates with with your own certificates if you if you want. That definitely helps as well for PCI compliance. Um, not because it makes it more secure using specific certificates necessarily. The underlying technology is still the same, but it does mean that. Um, the tools that run your PCI compliance checks aren't going to have a fit when they realize that this port is being secured by a self-signed self certificate. Um, yeah, just a, just a little thing there, but yeah, you can, you can replace those certificates with, which, with whichever certificates you need. And what if you're, what if you have a deep packet inspection going on? Uh, yeah, so there are some tricky things with, um, with that communication, if uh, yeah, if there is, if there are, sorry, other network, um, uh, like other network interruptions on the way through, there is proxy support for the tentacles, uh, tentacle agents as well. Um, so you can communicate with a tentacle through a proxy. Uh, so that's one option. The other option as well is that those tentacles can be installed as polling tentacles. Um, so by default, they're listening tentacles. They sit there doing essentially nothing until the Octopus server pings them with some new instructions. Uh, if that um, network port is not able to be opened on a production web server or something like that, you can set up that agent to poll the Octopus server itself, which can get rid of some of those, some of those issues. Um, as for deep packet inspection, uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> Is the is the short answer? I, I'm guessing if you have the certificate anyway, you can get around that, or you can you can repackage. Is that is that likely to be the case? Uh, various services that we have break and just stop working when yep. when the certificate injection happens. So wondering if mm -hmm. that would break. Uh, very likely, to be honest. Um, I w I would expect yeah if. If that uh, communication is uh, modified on the way through, then it's it's very likely to be uh, to be problematic. I would I would suspect the the port that's used by by out of interest is um so one oh nine four three by default, 
so that that port's actually registered to octopus so um there's there's a list somewhere of, of common ports for common applications so 104 sorry 10943 and 10933 i think are registered to octopus but it means you do have to handle that um that port and let octopus basically use those ports or you can change other ones for tentacles and and so on I assume we're going to get to the PowerShell part of it soon, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. This is all this is all set up um, okay. or explanation. How about how about we just do? Uh, we'll go through an Octopus demo from a developer perspective. So it's probably becoming clear at the moment that I'm a developer, not a not an operations guy. Um, so I'll do it from the from the developer perspective. <laughs> oh, this happened before. Let me just. Oops. There we go. Sorry, Parallels uses my, uh, loses my mouse every now and then. All right, so this is my amazing application. Look, for the purposes of this application and this demo as well, these are just um, IIS mappings all to the local machine. It makes demos much faster. It means I don't have to have multiple VMs running. Um, but we have our dev machine. We have some test production servers as well. So this is basically just a little Hello World app. It's dumping out some um, configuration details, sorry, some um, assembly details and then some configuration strings. And we'll see them later. There's a configuration string here just saying, hi from dev, uh, oops, wrong one. Hi from dev and then name of the tentacle as well and some, some database strings. I've got a, the source control is in Visual Studio Team Services and I have a CI build set up which will compile that, package it, and push it to Octopus, and then trigger a release, and then trigger a deployment. So, uh, and then in Octopus Deploy, I have this Hello World application, um, which is managing a dev environment, test environment, production. So I'm, I'm going to make a change and fire this, fire this off, and then we'll follow through what it actually does. So let's be a little bit more specific. Uh, make a change to a controller, and I'm just going to check this in. Now, this is using um, Visual, uh, sorry, uh, Team Foundation version control, which I generally wouldn't recommend, but that's the demo that's already set up, and I couldn't be bothered changing it to Git. So, um, so let's make a change, and we'll check it in. Okay. All right, so we've checked that guy in, and in Visual Studio Team Services, there's a build that's now in progress because we've made that change. It's a continuous integration build. So let's just quickly have a look at what that process looks like. Um, I've disabled a bunch of steps just for, just for speed purposes, but ultimately we're building the application. Um, we're copying the files around a little bit just so we can manage them a bit better. There's also an issue with Roslyn at the moment, so that required another step. Then we're telling uh, the build to package this application for Octopus, and then push it to Octopus, create a release for the Hello World project, and then deploy that release to our dev environment. That's all so in the build definition? What's that, sorry? That's all in the build definition with tasks that you guys add? It is, yeah. So the marketplace itself, um, we have an extension. Actually, I'll open that here. We have an extension called Octopus Deploy um, Integration, and it has... Uh, those five tasks. So we've got uh, package, push, create a release, deploy a release, and promote a release. So even if you are using release management for various other things, these will all work with release management as well. So you may want to package and push the application to Octopus using your build, and then in your release, maybe in your dev environment, create a release and deploy it to dev. And then in your uh, test environment, you might want to use the promote to promote that environment. So you can use both of them together. But it means that um, in your build definition, you just need to uh, fill out, you know, provide a connection to Octopus Deploy, and then give it the details that it needs. Um, there's also some cool stuff here where it gives you drop downs for the different projects that you've got in that instance as well. So we've got the Hello World here, one, that one here, and then any channels that you have, which I don't. Uh, so Look, let's look at how that build is going at the moment. It should probably be, oh no, it's still running. There we go. Let's have a look at that build, which is in progress. 
Now I'm basically finished. So it's gone through all of those steps and pushed to Octopus. And you can see in Octopus, it's, done, it's doing that final step now of deploying to our, de to our development environment. And we're done. So we should be able to see in our dev environment. Um, let me just refresh that. I think there's this uh, combination of power of um, parallels and PowerPoint, which means that I lose my cursor, which is really frustrating. So there we go. So that's that's done that deployment. So the only actual change that I made was was to the code and then committing that to the source control repository. And Octopus itself, along with Visual Studio Team Services for the build, uh, handled managing that, that deployment. There we go. So let's just have a quick look as well at the, um, oops, quick look at this process. So um, we've got, previous builds that we've done and where they've been deployed as well on the dashboard for this project. So we can see that um, the version running in production at the moment is 1157, which had a different title. So if we go to the production one, we can see that it's still on the last demo I did for channel nine. Um, but in dev, we've got our, our new one saying Arizona. In our test environment, we'll probably have that America one, I'm guessing, um, maybe not. Maybe just hello everyone or something like that. So if we wanted to promote this dev one to test, we can deploy through that lifecycle to, um, to the next environment. So we can define that environment as well. Um, we're just using the default lifecycle at the moment, which has our three environments, dev, test, and production. But it's up to you how you want to configure that lifecycle. So you can decide that uh, you want to deploy straight to production if you want, or have multiple environments with multiple different uh, phases in them as well. To answer part of your question, if you use this to promote your code from your environment's perspective, mm -hmm. you'll have your auditing you're talking about, right? Because you can see if you look on that on that dashboard that he showed, yep. you can see every version that you have in every environment at in one glance. Right, but I want to actually pull the values out of the configuration file. Because our problem is, is that somehow somebody changes one of those. Ah, uh, yes, we, we we will get to that. I can skip. Well, uh, all right, uh, we will get to that. Um, there is a demo a little bit later on of of pulling files down from multiple machines and things like that. Um, if you're happy to wait. <laughs> so. oh, fine. Yeah, down fine. Cool. Um, the other thing as well in terms of auditing, if we have a look at this. Uh, 1162 that went. We've got a history of everything that happened with this release. So we deployed it to dev. Uh, we can see that, sorry, the admin decided to deploy it to dev. It's deployed to dev and then succeeded as well. So we've got this audit log of all of the different environment, all of the different things that happened. We've also got the actual logs from the target server. So this is going to a dev server, which in the, in this example is my local machine, but it, co it could be anything um, anywhere as well. So we're acquiring packages. Um, we actually had that version in cache, so we didn't need to download it. Um, we had a previous version in cache, I think. And so we could just do a delta compression. So we're not sending the entire application over the wire. We're just sending the diff uh, between the items. So there we go. We had 61 and uh, we could do a delta with 62. So really, we only sent a very small amount of information rather than, rather than the whole lot. The logs for actually deploying the application and setting up IIS also came from that target machine. So if you're deploying to 30 different machines, you, could, you will see the logs from those 30 different machines all be pulled back into Octopus. So it's pr probably a little bit more visible in production where we have two web servers. So we can see the logs from the production web server one and production web server two separately. Yeah. Um, this is the formatted logs as well. They actually come back just as raw files too. So the raw logs are getting pulled back from, um, from those target servers. All right. So I, I've mentioned these environments, but, but what do they actually look like? So we've got 
an environments tab here and we've got our dev environment, our test environment and our production environment. So our dev environment has just the one machine, test has one machine, but production has three. And the way we decide what these machines do is by assigning them roles. So our one server that we've got here has the role of web server and app server, the same in test. But when we get to production, we have two web servers and an app server. So what that means is any steps that get run um, that need to run on a web server, in production, they'll run on both of these machines. But in dev, they'll run here. Similarly, any steps for an app server will run on this machine, but only on this one in production. So you can separate these machines into the roles that they, um, they perform according to your application that you're deploying. So if we have a look at our project again, we can see this is a very, very easy example. So there's only one step and it's deploying our package. And it's doing that on the web server role only. So when we do this to dev, it'll go to that one machine, test one machine, and then production, it'll go to our two web servers. Now there's a few, there's a few details in here. So this is, um, we're specifying the package that actually gets deployed. And then there's some features that let us configure IAS, um, the website, application pool, things like that, and any bindings. We're also using variables here, which I'll get into in a little bit, which, which are different depending on the environment that you're in. So you can scope variables to different, different environments. I'll talk about that in a sec. So we know how to deal with IIS. There's a few other things that we know how to do as well. Windows services, we know how to manage um, if you're using an older version of IIS. Uh, Database deployment as well is pretty handy. We use the Redgate tools here. Uh, and I'll show you again, there's a bunch of other steps that you can use for more specific items. Cool. Uh, we're also doing some configuration transforms uh, and setting configuration variables. Now I'll talk about that a little bit later, but it means that if there's a web.config file with a variable in it that matches a variable in Octopus, then it will just replace that. Um, and if there's a, a, a configuration transform file that matches a variable, sorry, it matches uh, the environment that you're deploying to or the machine you're deploying to, or even if you want to specify a transform specifically, it, it can do that as well. So this is part of the externalizing your configuration so that when you're deploying the application to test, you're deploying it with the test values. And when you're deploying it to production, you're deploying it with the production configuration. Cool. All right, so that, that's a pretty basic uh, example of, of how it fits together. Are there any questions on that just before I moved on to the script steps? I think we're good. Good. Great. All right, so let's... So let's talk about script steps. So um, I mentioned this before, but um, we, we had a... a, a single deployment step there which basically deployed a package but with script steps you can deploy anything so anything you can script you can do basically with octopus um, now obviously we're going to be focusing on powershell uh, but if you're using uh, script cs you can use that or um, bash if you're in linux or f sharp if you if you really want to do that as well um, Scoping variables is something we're going to have a look at in a second as well. And that means that you can run the same scripts uh, in different environments, but certain values will be, uh, sorry, certain uh, PowerShell variables will be available to you that will have different values in different environments. And there's a whole lot of built-in ones. And then you can also specify your own and scope them appropriately. Uh, we'll have a look as well at script modules and using script modules and then also some step templates and finally just um, the community library. So this is really just what we're going to go through in this little demo. All right, so let's jump back. Uh, we'll have a look in our PowerShell project. So now we're just going to skip the idea of, of deploying a package, mainly because it's a little bit um, involved, I suppose. You need to build the application, you need to push it to Octopus and so on. So we're just going to have a script only process. So let's add a step. We'll pretend that we've just done some work and we're going to add a script step. So just a step to run a script. I'm going to call it a Slack notification. 
Is ever, does anybody use Slack, by the way? Yes. Yep. <clears throat> a few people? Cool. It was kind of the easiest thing for me to, to put in there. Now, I'm going to run this. Uh, I'm actually going to run it on the Octopus server, but on behalf of the application server. So if I run it on that deployment target, that means that it actually gets executed on that target machine using the account that that technical agent is set up as. But I can also run it on the Octopus server on behalf of that of that um, machine. What that means is all of the variables will be set appropriately for that machine, but it will just run on the server. So there's no need to push files over the wire or um, push commands over the wire and wait for them to come back. This is pretty useful for doing things like deploying databases. You don't necessarily need to connect to a third, uh, sorry, to another server just to run a database script. You may as well just do that from the Octopus machine. Um, here, I'm going to just going to do it because it's slightly faster. Although everything's local, so it's probably not going to make a big deal. Um, you can either just give it the source, or you can give it code that's inside a package or, or scripts that are inside a package. And what that means is if you need to version your PowerShell scripts, then you can do that by packaging, patching, sorry, packaging them up into a NuGet package or a zip file, providing them to Octopus, and then in Octopus just saying, I want to use the package that's in, sorry, the script that's in this package. So that's good for keeping your scripts in source control. But just for ease of use, I'm going to put it in our source code here. All right, now let's see if this stuff works. There we go. So this is a pretty basic script. Uh, it's just a, a function that writes to, sorry, that sends a message to Slack. Uh, and then our message is just that we've deployed this release to Octopus, to the environment successfully. So these variables here, Octopus release number and Octopus environment name, they will be change. They will change depending on the uh, environment that we're deploying to and the release that we're deploying to. So this is all pretty, uh, pretty self-explanatory. Now I think I might have got this wrong slightly. There we go. Does that look right? I'm just going to assume that that's going to work perfectly. All right. So now we have our one script step. Um, in this, in, in this. Uh, Example, we're only going to test and production just to makes it a little bit easier. So let's create a release uh, and we will call it 1000, save that release. And again, this is just our snapshot. We haven't actually deployed it anywhere yet. And we're going to deploy to our test environment. So what that's going to do is it's going to run that script on our server. It succeeded. We've actually got a notification because I turned them on. But in our Slack, we've got this Octopus notification. So we're ultimately just running a PowerShell script as part of our deployment. And we've deployed that to tests, to our test environment spe uh, specifically. So that's that's pretty straightforward. I mean, that that's not very exciting. Uh, let's just modify that script a little bit. Uh, and we'll, we'll take out the message here and we'll replace that with a variable. So let's kill that. And we'll give it a variable like message for Slack. Now, I haven't defined that anywhere. Let's do that. We'll save that script. And then in our variables tab, we can provide that message for Slack variable. Let's give it a value which is the same as what it was, more or less. And we'll scope that to a test environment. So what that means is when we're deploying in test, that variable is going to contain this value. Oh, wow. That's interesting. One. Right. And then when we're in production, we're going to have a slightly different message. So deployed project name, version, whatever, to Octopus environment name successfully. So we'll scope that to production. So we have this one variable, which just has two different values depending on the scope. So depending on where we're deploying it to. And we've changed our process as well, just to use that variable. Um, now we have to create a new release because this release, remember, is a snapshot of the steps that are required to deploy as well as any packages. So if we deployed this, uh, promoted this to production, we'd have the old behavior. So to get the new behavior, we need to create a new release. 
and we'll leave it as 101. Save that, deploy to test. And that should work pretty much straight away. And we can see that's our test message. PowerShell Project 101 is in test. And if we promote that to production, we should see a different message deployed PowerShell Project 101 to production successfully. It's a really simple example there, but it shows that you can use uh, variables that are scoped to your different environments. Um, so that you can deploy the same stuff to different environments or run the sc same scripts and just have different values available um, to your PowerShell scripts. So one thing I didn't show as well is this little drop dropdown. Uh, that gives you the all of the variables that are available for you in your script. So we've got our message for Slack one, but we've also got all these built-in ones. So there's a ton of different ones that Octopus provides uh, for you. Uh, and you can also use output variables as well. So you can do a set octopus variable in a script in one step and then look for that variable later on in a subsequent script. So if you wanted to read some information from that target machine and then use it in a later script, you can do that. Um, new octopus artifact is a way of pulling files from that target machine all the way back. So if you wanted to look at the configuration, for example, on all of your web servers as part of your deployment process, then you can have this new Octopus artifact that pulls that file back from each of the servers and keeps it on the Octopus server for you. Um, that one's particularly useful outside the uh, context of a deployment as well, which I'll show you in a sec. And that, that comes back to um, the question of, of looking at the state of an environment as well and the health of, of those targets. So we'll, I'll show you that little snippet um, a bit later. Awesome. So any any questions on how that how that script step works? It's a very simple example, obviously, but it shows, you know, using those those um, script steps as part of your deployment process. You can use okay. script steps in between your packages too. That's what, I, what we did. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's a really common thing to do. In fact, it's a very common pattern um, to deploy your application and then have a script step subsequently that does some work to that deployed project or to that, to that deployed code. So if we were in our Hello World application, we've got this one script, uh, one package step, but if we wanted to, I don't know, uh, a common one might be removing that server from a load balancer. So you'd have a script step to start off with to, to remove the machine you're deploying to from the load balancer, then deploy the application, run a couple of tests, make sure it's okay, and then add it back into the load balancer. And you can actually do that as a rolling deployment too. So if we're deploying to all of those machines, you can configure a rolling deployment to say, I want to deploy to one server at a time or to, you know, uh, to five servers at a time. So that, that can be really handy as well. But having script steps in between these package steps is a really common practice. Um, can you, in the middle of a deployment, like pause it so that maybe you have to delete a directory or files or can you do manual steps? You can. Yeah, there's two ways to do it. Um, there is also, there is a manual uh, intervention step. But that's that's exactly what you're asking for there. Um, the other thing you can do as well is you can set up a project so that um, where is it? Oh, they've they've moved my cheese. Um, where is it? Process maybe. It's probably in the life cycle. Anyway, let's have a look. Or in the channel. I haven't looked at this one for a while, but you can change the uh, failure um, mechanism so that if there is a failure, it will notify you and pause and give you a give you a chance to to um, to fix that later on, and then continue. I really thought it was here. Nope. Okay. Let's have a look at it in, in environments. So if we edit this test environment, um, we can turn guided failure on by default. So you can do this at a project level. I know you can, I just can't find it anymore. Um, but you can say that if something goes wrong during a deployment, then use guided failure. So it'll pause 
ask for user intervention and your options become, do you want to retry this or do you want to uh, ignore this error and just continue with the next step or do you want to cancel and abort the whole thing? So that's one way of, of making sure that, uh, for example, if you're dropping files in a location and there's not enough disk space, that's probably something you can fix pretty quickly and just continue the deployment. You don't need to fail it, work out what happened, come back again and, and start again. Well, I mean, so that's one example. You have that check before you even deploy, right? Check this space. Uh, sorry, say that again. That I, do you have that check as just an option before you even deploy to check the disk space? Yeah, so you can do, you can set it up with uh, the actual environment that itself. So in our test environment, um, whenever you're deploying anything to this environment, it will use guided value mode by default. Um, or you can do it on the project and maybe it's, there we go. Okay, it's when you actually do a deployment. Right. Yep, there you go. That's why I couldn't find it. Um, so yeah, it's set either at, a, at an environment level by default or when you do the deployment, you can say, I wanna use this guided failure mode. Awesome. All right, I'm just going to make one more change to this um, to this code. So everything here, this function is probably useful outside just this individual script. So maybe I, I want a few steps in my process that let Slack know that things have happened. So I can pull this out and put it into a script module. So in library, um, so library is basically the collection of all of the things that get shared across um, Octopus. In script modules, I can add a new one, call it uh, notification, save that, and then I'll put that function in here instead. The indenting is a bit strange, but there we go. So we'll save that. And then back in our project, we can now say, um, I want to use uh, this script module. So I want to include the Slack notification script module. So in our process here, um, we're not explicitly referencing it. We're just using that, um, that commandlet. So if we create a release and deploy it, it should just still work the same way. And there we go, we got our notification. So that, that's good for you know, scripts that get used across, across multiple projects as well which is pretty handy. Um, but it might be even more useful rather than having, uh, rather than people with different projects to have all of this in one uh, every time they need to do a deployment, just to have an individual step that knows a bit more about, about Slack and knows how to run it. So I'm gonna turn this into a script template as well. So let's just grab that code for the moment. I'm gonna leave it there just in case I make a mistake which has been known to happen. I'm gonna add a new step template. You can see I've got a bunch of ones that I've been using for various things across the, across the um, stage. And we've also got community step templates. So one's provided by the community. I'll get to that in a sec, but for the moment, I'm just gonna add a new one. Uh, and it's going to be based on a script step. So you can actually base it on a whole lot of other steps as well. So maybe if you wanted to deploy an IS website and then run some code after that every single time, you could do that by basing your um, step template on this step here. But I'm just going to base it on the step process, uh, sorry, on the script step. So notify Slack, and then in step, I can put my code. So a couple of things here. One is that this message is a message for Slack, which was a variable that, that occurred in the other, um, yeah, in our project. So that's not going to be appropriate for every, every, uh, for every project we have. So instead, I'm going to set a parameter for this, um, uh, for this step calls, um, what's this? message to send just to um, vary it a little bit. Uh, the label is going to say um, 
Slack message. And we're just going to leave it as a single line text box. We could have various other types, drop downs, check boxes, password boxes, and even the name of a previous step. So that can be really useful if you are following that pattern of dropping some files on the server and then running some scripts afterwards. You can let the person, but let the user of this step uh, drop the files on their server and then just refer to that step where you can pull out values like where did that step go to, oh sorry, where did the files go to in that previous step and so on. Line text box, uh, we won't give it a default value. And I'm just going to add one more as well, which is our um, back URL. And again, single line text box. So now back in our script, we can set our message to, again, using this drop down, our message to send. So that value is going to be populated with whatever the, the user of this step uh, provides in those parameters. Uh, and our hook URL, I'll just put that in the clipboard. We're going to set that to our Slack URL. Some pretty inconsistent casing there, but let's ignore that. And we'll save that. So back in our project now, in our PowerShell project, let's we'll leave that one there for the moment, but we'll add a new step. And we can see our notify Slack step that we just created. Now, there is a community step that already does that, by the way. So this is completely pointless. You could just use the one that the community has provided. But I'm going to add mine. And you can see, we'll just um, do the same thing again, run it on the Octopus server. And our Slack message is going to be message for Slack, which again is our project level scoped variable for the message we're sending. And then our URL that we're sending to is our Slack URL. Uh, actually, I can't do that. I have to do this. So the uh, format for filling in variables from uh, from Octopus is different um, in the fields that it would be for PowerShell. In PowerShell, we use the convention of you know dollar variable name, and in these fields, we use um, what we call a uh, oh, what is it? Um, it's based on one of the web frameworks uh, handlebars, so we use that format for for variables there. So what's going to happen is it's going to run that script that we have in our script step, passing in these parameters, and then that script should use those parameters. So again, we should get exactly the same thing as we did before. Uh, I'm just going to disable that first step because we don't need it anymore. Uh, we'll create a new release and deploy it to test just to prove that that works. Again, notification. So exactly the same as we got before, it's just that now any project can use that, that process step. So we can share those scripts across multiple projects as well. So if there's something that all of your applications need to do as part of their deployment, that's a, a great way to put them, great place to put them. Uh, one little note as well, I'm still importing the script module for this project because this step relies on it. So if you're using a step template, it's probably a good idea not to use that module and to have the functions in line in that script. If I had removed this script module, then that script that runs to notify Slack is not gonna know what that, what that Slack notification function is. So yeah, um, as a general word of advice, don't use the modules um, if you're using script steps or don't have the script steps rely on the modules is probably a better way of putting it. Do you still have the uh, one-off uh, task where you could run a PowerShell script against like uh, a myriad of machines? I used to use that quite a bit. Yeah, I do. That's the, uh, I should really put that earlier on because I think that's come up a few times. Let's skip ahead and do that one. Um, so one thing that we, uh, we can see as well is the tasks that run. So the way Octopus operates is it basically queues a task to run and then um, and then that task will get picked up um, by the server essentially and get farmed out to the different machines that need to run it. So we can see this deployment was a task in Octopus and that's where our, um, our logs occurred and things like that. But if we go to the tasks um, page, there's a script console on the top right. 
So let's um, just, yeah, so basically this is a way of running scripts across uh, a bunch of different machines. So you can either choose individual targets, in which case the individual machines themselves are listed, or you can run it on all of them in a particular environment with a particular role. So if I want to run it on my production web servers, for example, I should be able to run that script. Now, I'm hoping this isn't going to break because everything's running locally and it's going to clash, but let's try it anyway. Okay. So this is going to do a couple of things. Um, first, it's going to be really, really horrible formatting. You know what? I'm not going to trust that. I'm just going to do this instead. All right, there we go. Um, so we're basically going to have a look at all of the web servers in our production environment, check that they have at least 100 gig free, which is probably overkill, but I know how much space I've got on my machine. So I know that that's not, there's not enough, uh, not enough left. We're going to uh, have a look at the disk. We're just going to use the um, WMI object to have a look at the C drive. Um, and then Uh, get the free space available and then just check that um, there's enough free space. If not, um, there is going to be a warning. Um, so we're going to write a warning to the, to the, uh, to the uh, log. We're going to hit that Slack URL as well with a different, with a notification as well. So let's just, where are we? Let's just try and run that. See what happens. So it's identified that there are two production web servers and both of them or neither of them have enough space, which is expected because they're running on the same machine. So we got these two Slack notifications. Um, so that's basically just the script that's run on both of those machines. So you can run whatever script you want, ultimately. Um, if it's not quite right, you can modify it and rerun it. And again, you're not restricted to PowerShell. You can use C Sharp, Bash or F Sharp if you really want. This new artifact file name function as well can be really handy. So let me see, do I have that? There we go, I do. So let's do that again, but we're going to do one more thing. We're going to uh, just write out all of the web bindings from IIS and we're going to grab the machine name itself into a variable and then write a new file, just pulling the deployment journal from Octopus itself and writing it to a file with the machine name in it. So I'll, I'll run it first and then we'll have a look at that script just to see what, just to show you what it does. What he was talking about where you could actually pull back the data that you want from many yep. machines. As long as you have a technical so, on that, I found this very yep. useful when I used it in my previous job where you could actually ad hoc run up against almost anything you needed to within your purview as you, you know, what administrating the machine, whatever it is yeah. you need to do. Yeah. It allows for uh, quickly writing a script. You don't have to worry about all the plumbing uh, that you have with, um, oh, shoot, with remoting and all that kind of stuff because it takes care of it all for you. So, yeah, you can see um, that's run on both of the servers. We've dumped out on each of those servers individually, although, again, just the same, same server, so it's not terribly useful. But we've dumped out all of the IES bindings. From that, from each machine, and in our summary, we've got these two attachments. We've got um, production web server one, which was the machine name of this guy, uh, deployment journal, and production web server two, deployment journal. So those files, you can just download them, and they are, yeah, they're the file that's been pulled from that target machine and pulled back to the Octopus server, so you can examine it later if you want. And that's all that. So that took place on that machine, right? And that what you pull back? Yes. Yeah, that's right. I basically just picked a file that I knew was text-based that I knew was going to be on that machine. Um, the example, there's documentation about this, and the example that they give is pulling back the host file on all of the machines. Um, unfortunately, and I'm not sure whether it was just something was going a bit weird with my machine at the time, but running, running that across two machines seemed to have a problem with it. I'm not sure exactly why. I actually think it might be something to do with parallels because when I switched away from Windows, suddenly it was open in Excel for some reason. But um, 
I didn't try to diagnose, I just picked a different file. Yeah, so this can be really useful for um, just finding out what's going on on those machines. Uh, the, first, the first example I gave was basically um, checking that there was enough disk space on all of those machines. There's another way to do that that I'll, I'll talk about in a sec. That's a bit more regular and a bit more um, structured. Um, but yeah, that's, that's definitely useful for examining what's going on with your machines. The other thing is uh, you don't have to use particular environments. You can do individual targets. So if you notice that this server here is not behaving um, and you've got some notifications that, hey, this server over here is not healthy, you could just run a bash script, for example, on that Ubuntu server to find out what's going on, maybe. Have a look at what's what processes are running or have a look at what's what's happening on that machine without having to um, you know, log in remotely. So yeah, really handy, handy to do. All right, cool. Did I jump ahead on you, Damien? I didn't mean to. No, no, that's okay. Um, it, it had been asked a couple of times, so I'll, I um, I'll just skip over that that demo <laughs> when, when we get to it. <laughs> or I can do it again. It's easy. I've got the snippets. Um, <laughs> all right, cool. So we've got um, what, we've I done. What's the, um, on the client on every machine, you said it runs as a Windows service on a Windows box? What is the Correct. Windows service? How does, well, sorry. How does it get there for the first time? Ah, right. So the, the short answer is um, there's an MSI that you can download on those machines, or um, there is a, a DSC um, package, so PowerShell DSC for those target. Uh, sorry, for the tentacle, which will configure it that way. Um, so you can do that as part of your provisioning script if that's if that's what you need to do. Um, there is also an extension in Azure. So if you have VMs running in Azure, you can add that as an extension to your uh, virtual machine and it will spin up a, a um, an Octopus tentacle and register it with, back with Octopus as well. Um, literally everything in Octopus is scriptable as well, <clears throat> which is probably... Uh, something that was designed right from the start. So that MSI can be installed silently. And then all of the configuration actually happens after the fact on the command line. So uh, if we just open... Um, I'm just wondering, do we have to log into all the servers or is it just done automatically? Uh, it's, not auto it's not done automatically, but you can, um, you can script that from remotely as well. So... Traditionally, yeah, people will log into those machines, install the MSI, and then run through the, the configuration. But you don't have to do that. You can, um, you can script that change. So as long as you can get to that machine um, using, I don't know, uh, PowerShell remoting or something like that, you just need to run, command line, uh, run uh, a command line on that target machine, and it will install and configure itself and connect to Octopus as well. So it's not something you have to do manually, but it is something you have to do on that target machine. Um, the Octopus server doesn't really have permission to, to push things to a target machine um, in general. Yeah. Both a Windows and a, a Linux um, server? Uh, yeah, it, yeah with, with the Linux machines, um, you can actually add, you just need to set up an SSH connection. So however that configuration works in um, on that target Linux box, if you set up a um, an SSH connection, sorry, if you set up an account on that machine which has um, the ability to, to um, communicate over SSH, that's something you can do um, explicitly as well. Asking yeah. Octopus servers. Huh? The Octopus servers themselves. Yeah, so that, it has to collect somewhere, right? Uh, the Octopus. Oh, sorry, I see. So yeah, you can add a deployment target manually like this um, by adding a listening tentacle, giving it the target that it's. It's. Well, sorry, adding the tentacle, giving it the machine it needs to communicate to the port, um, and things like that. But this is also all available over the API as well. So anything in Octopus um, is actually API-driven. So um, 
you can, I think, uh, actually, I'm not sure. There's a command line tool, um, octo.exe, which lets you do a lot of the stuff with Octopus Deploy. I'm not sure whether it lets you um, register tentacles, but you can definitely do it over the API. So, um, run machines. But the Octopus server itself, when I used it in 2.0, was running on Windows. Windows, okay, it runs on. So you have to. Run. Oh, sorry, I, I completely misunderstood the question. Yes, the Octopus server itself needs to run on Windows. Okay, right. Correct. The tentacles can run on on whatever he was talking about with those tentacles. Yeah, that's, that's what's Microsoft available server. to you. Yeah. Gotcha. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, let me just quickly check. Um, So installation, um, installing the server. So yeah, the requirements are requirements are for the server uh, 2008 SP2 or above. Um, and we say server with a GUI, not server core, but people have actually got it running on server core. It's just we haven't tested it thoroughly yet. Um, so we're not willing to, to say it's officially supported. But yeah, it, it does really work. Answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Sorry for the misunderstanding there. It's, um, okay, that's why I'm here to help you. Yeah, awesome. Uh, cool. All right, so that's, that is um, – there we go. So we're back. Let's, uh, let's jump back to the slides quickly. So um, that was the script demo. Uh, Let's have a look at, and I, and I realize that the time's creeping on a bit, so we'll have a look at really br really briefly convention-based scripts. So these are scripts that you can have in packages. So I showed you before that, or I mentioned before, that you can either explicitly define the script that needs to run and explicitly write that in there, or you can say, I want to get a script from a package. But if you have, for example, a web application and you always want that web application, when it's deployed, to run a particular command after deployment, then you can do that by including a convention-based file name, uh, a, a script with a convention-based file name in that package. So alongside that web project, the Hello World one, I could have a pre-deploy PS1, deploy PS1, post-deploy, or deploy failed. And what they do is more or less self-explanatory, but um, just to clarify a bit more in detail, if you're deploying a website to IIS, for example, pre-deploy will happen uh, before anything else goes on. So before the files are pushed over um, and extracted to their location, it will run this pre-deploy script. So maybe you're using that to prepare some folders or something like that. Um, deploy will run after the files get dumped on that machine, but before you run any special operations like configuring IIS. Um, Post-deploy will run after, every, after Octopus has done everything it needs to do um, with that package. And then deploy failed is pretty self-explanatory as well. It'll do that if something goes wrong during the process. And again, you're not restricted to PowerShell if you don't want. You can have .csx, .fsx, and .sh if you're going to Linux. So um, those conventions mean that you can just include a script alongside your package and you don't even have to tell Octopus, um, you know, that you don't have to provide Octopus with that script that needs to run. So. This is probably the quickest demo ever because I know how long these builds take to run. So this build I ran before, if we have a look at the project that ran, let's look at Hello World. And in our Hello World project, we have a deploy.ps1. And I've done probably the absolute easiest thing possible. I'm just writing, uh, doing a write host. But because this is called deploy PS1, it will run at that appropriate place when Octopus deploys a package which has that in it. So let's just jump back to Octopus. We'll have a look at this deployment that we did and have a look at the logs. And we can see that line, I'm done deploying, just happened as part of that deployment. So what that means is alongside your code that you're deploying, you can have these convention-based scripts and not have to explicitly tell Octopus to do these, to do these extra commands. So yeah, really basic thing, but something that's very, very um, powerful. So no, no, no. So when you're, oftentimes when you install code, right, if you install it for an application or whatnot, 
you'll have to do something in the middle. Maybe you got to contact an MQ series server, or you got to talk to another web server and get a certificate. Something that has to run during your deploy time, right? right. So what you do is you take you take a script that you would normally have to run either before or after or during or what have you, and you bundle it with the code so that when that package is delivered, it always runs that during during the, the what Damien just mentioned would be either before, during, or after, or during a failure condition, right? Mm -hmm. So that yep. you get a repeatable, and not only do you have the, the code that actually runs the business function, you have the code that stands up that business function, being able to be source controlled, if you will. So you can control the whole shoot and match. So every time you go in, you maybe you disable SCOM, and you maybe you, um, um, oh gosh, like I said, you have to connect to some other service and register and unregister yourself or check a registry entry or whatever it is, right, that needs special credentials or has some other run criteria that you would have to run. You can package it with your code so it runs at the same time or nearly the same time, which is so you extremely package, handy. You can package in like specific user names and things like that to actually have it. Yeah, yeah, you could, but that would be more. Uh, the um, what he showed you earlier was the really nice thing is they have this notion of scoped variables. Oh yeah. yeah. So the scope variable is really nice because you can say, okay, I always wanted to find this variable. I always know it's this name, but I want it to change when I go to this environment versus that one, or this condition, or that condition, or this special server, or that kind of thing. There's all kinds of different paradigms that you can use to change your variables up to sculpt them the way that you want them. And that's what's really great about this tool. I mean, it's, I mean, it's phenomenal. For some of those, that scope, that variable scoping is awesome. Yep. On the variable scoping as well, I, um, I did have uh, the scoping based on environment, but you can also scope it based on roles. So uh, based on roles, based on individual targets. So if my second production web server has some different configuration than my first one, you can do that. Or even steps, which is which is interesting. Um, I don't know why you would do that and not just have a different variable name, but you know, maybe maybe there's a clash in there as well. Um, so you can you can have a lot of control over that scope. Um, I'm not going to get into it today because that, that could be another two or three hour presentation by itself, but you can have different channels for deployment as well. So you can have your normal standard channel, which goes through dev, test, production, and then you might have a separate channel, which is a hotfix channel, and it goes straight to production and then backfills to the other ones. If you're using those channels as different ways of deploying your code, you can also scope based on channel. And if you're using tenants, which is even more complicated, then you can scope on individual tenants too. So there's a lot of power um, with that scoping. Yeah, it's one of the best things about the product. That and the fact that all the things that you can do in PowerShell with creating modules and scripts and all that business, as you, as you saw, you can use it inside of the application when you're deploying the app. You can use it outside when you're doing, like if you got to do a maintenance activity, you can use the same script that you use for, I mean, it's tremendous what you can do with it. It's really cool. Very ingenious. Cool. All right. Uh, so conventions, that was, that was pretty basic. Script console, thankfully, I've already done that demo. So um, the key things here really is you don't need to configure a deployment. I will mention as well that um, it's quite common to have a project in Octopus Deploy that doesn't actually deploy any software. And this is something that a lot of people do. Um, there's a company in Australia uh, called Domain who do like, um, uh, they do real estate say, uh, searches and, and things like that. So if you're renting a house, you, you go and look on there to find out what houses are available for rent. They use Octopus Deploy very thoroughly. Um, and one thing they do is they have a bunch of projects in Octopus that are only there to spin up infrastructure and spin it back down again. So it's not actually deploying any code. It's not deploying any software. It's just running scripts to spin things up in AWS and, and tear them down again under different circumstances. So if there is something, sorry, what was that? No, you might have heard an echo. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, yeah, so if there is something that is, re is a repetitive task or something that you um, want to 
a bunch of steps that you need to perform on an ongoing basis. You can set up a project that will just let you run those across a fleet of um, machines in an environment, you know, whenever you want. So run 10, 15 scripts at a time across all of your machines, but set that up as a project. The script console is more for ad hoc. So you might have a script that you just want to run across a bunch of machines on an ad hoc basis. Um, so yeah, you don't need a deployment to actually do that work. And again, you can target individual machines or whole environments if you need um, just, to, just to run the scripts on those target machines. And then the other nice thing about that script console is, let's say that I as an admin need to run it and then I got to turn it over to you for night shift. Well, you could go back and look and see what stuff I've run and what was happening during my, my shift maybe to help you out with something or you know something operationally if you need to. Because whatever you run inside that console is actually recorded. Yeah, it, it might be worth mentioning that really quickly. That audit page, we've done a bit of work too. So that used to be a horrible page. Well, basic, not horrible. It basically used to just give you a, a list of everything that had happened. So we can see here that I ran this task script run from Management Console. Um, if I click on that, I, I get a deep link into the actual task that ran. Um, but in recent versions, we have added filters to this as well. So we could say that um, groups of events like uh, auto deploys happened, uh, deployment events, all that kind of thing. Or we can say, um, only get me the things that the user's done. And only, um, I don't know, only when a deployment failed or something. Yeah. So there's uh, or when a task was cancelled. So that, that gives you the ability to add these um, these tasks in there as well. Further to that, you can actually subscribe to those events, and this is a new thing as well. So you can do a search across those events and then be emailed when something happens. Um, why why I'm in that weird time zone? I'm not sure. Um, so you can either email or hit a URL. So be notified when something happens, like a um, machine critical event. So a machine cleanup failed or a machine was not available anymore. So get a notification when that happens. Um, I'll, I'll touch on it a little bit later as well, but um, you can also subscribe to these events and trigger deployments at a particular time. So if, for example, a machine becomes unavailable, you can trigger an event which will run a project which runs some scripts that tears that out of the load balancer, spins up a new one and adds it back in. So you can do a lot of a lot of cool stuff that way. All right, let's. So we've got a, I think about ten minutes left. Um, let's just quickly mention this health check as well. So I mentioned before, if um, a couple of times that if Octopus decides that a machine is not contactable anymore or is not available anymore, you can do things about it. By default, that's all it does. It it checks that the machine is there and that there's about I think three gig of disk space left over, that's the default health check. But you can set up machine policies to check a whole lot of other stuff as well. Basically, it gives you the ability to add a script that you can define to determine the health of a target. And it can return healthy, healthy with warnings, unhealthy or unavailable. And your projects can behave in particular ways against machines that have um, returned these these different statuses. So for example, you might define uh, healthy as you know, a machine that's no problem, but then healthy with warnings as something where the CPU is greater than, the CPU usage is greater than 80%. And then you can still deploy to it, you can still work with it, but you're gonna get a warning in your logs and you can subscribe to those warnings and be notified that something is going wrong. Or you can say it's unhealthy, do not deploy to this. And that can be really useful if, you know, you're, you can run some scripts in there to say things like, hey, this doesn't have um, sufficient disk space. You should not do anything with this machine. Let me sort it out. Beyond that as well, uh, unavailable machines are just ones that Octopus can't talk to at all. So that connection is just not available. And you can set Octopus up so that if it can't see a machine for an extended period of time, it will just remove that machine and pretend it doesn't exist which is a really useful uh, story in the case of elastic environments. So that used to be a bit of a, a tricky thing to handle with Octopus Deploy, but um, now if you have a, a self-scaling environment, maybe um, 
uh, on Amazon with um, you know EC uh, sorry with uh, ELB. If Amazon decides or AWS decides to pull a machine out, Octopus can't talk to it anymore. So Octopus just removes it so it doesn't try to deploy to that machine anymore. So that can be pretty handy. Um, and then from that, you can also do deployment triggers that I mentioned. So when a machine event occurs, like a new machine comes online or one disappears, you can trigger a deployment. And again, a deployment doesn't have to be deploying code. It can just be running a bunch of scripts, maybe to spin up a new server, or as we'll look at in a sec, um, maybe to uh, refresh a DSC configuration. So uh, let's have a quick look at that health check. So these machines all at the moment have the default uh, machine policy. So that's the default one there. But I've created another one called health check notification. And it basically has a script in it that checks that we've got this 100 gig, like I was showing before in that script console, and then sends a message to Slack um, if it's not, uh, if it doesn't have enough, and writing a, war writing a warning as well. So let's go to our environment. And just for the purposes of making this easy, let's actually we'll do it in test because we've got our script steps. And we'll change the machine policy for our test environment to this health check notification. So let's save that. And we'll check the health. So by default, um, you probably saw actually, I'll have a look in machine policy, this health check will run every one hour. So Octopus will automatically run this script every hour, but you can trigger it um, specifically if you want to. So let's just check the health of all of the machines in that environment. And we can see that that one is now unhealthy. And we've got our notification in Slack. And in our environments, we can see that that machine, it's actually sharing a machine here. That's why both of them are highlighted. But it's got a, a yellow um, glow here, just to say that it's not healthy at all. If we were to change that again to say, rather than writing a warning, there's two things you can do. You can either do uh, writing an error or um, fail health check as well is another function. Actually, I'm not sure of the spelling of that, so I'm just going to, or the casing of that, so I'm just going to make it um, write error. So if that, if that's the uh, script that runs, you can um, fail it in that case. So let's check the health of that guy. And now it's a failed tentacle. So that machine there is now red. You cannot, it, it's marked as unhealthy. And what you do with that information depends on the project. You, your project might decide that it's still fine to deploy to unhealthy machines, or it might decide that un, it, you're gonna skip deployments to unhealthy machines, for example. So let's, uh, let's just go to this project quickly and we will set up a deployment trigger. So I mentioned this really briefly, but this is an automatic deployment that will happen. Um, actually, let's do it on the Hello World one. And let's uh, set this up so that there's a trigger called auto deploy when, so I can either choose groups of machine events. So all of the, if any of these things happen, but I'm gonna be a bit more specific then. Uh, now and just say a machine has been found healthy, which is where it previously wasn't healthy. And then I'm going to redeploy that if that's if that occurs as well. So this is going to be a bit of a race, but that trigger is going to work. We're going to open that in a new tab. We're going to go to our environment and rather than adding more disk space, I'm just going to change the machine policy so it's a bit more sensible and make sure that at least I have at least one gig save that, rerun my health check. And you should see, hopefully, if everything goes well, that by rechecking the health of that um, machine on a periodic basis, Octopus will collect those, um, those events that have happened and then trigger deployments based on what's gone on. Let me just check that that's succeeded. There we go. So at some point, hopefully our test machine or our dev machine, because it's the same tentacle, should redeploy 1157 and 1162 because that event has occurred and so that we've triggered a new deployment. Cool. 
So this can be really handy for um, if a machine goes, uh, sorry, if you have transient machines. So useful for people who have laptops, for example, running applications that you want to deploy to those laptops. They don't have to be connected all the time. So you can set up a trigger just to say, look, when that occurs, um, run a new deployment. So I think that's happened twice because there were two machines that, that have been picked up um, because we're sharing that tentacle, which is a little bit of a, an annoying thing with the demo. But So yeah, when laptops come back online, you can trigger a new deployment. That's cool. Cool. So that's a pretty new thing as well. Um, we can take that one step further when we talk about PowerShell DSC. Now, this one I don't have a demo for because it's a little bit too involved, but there is a complete walkthrough that Paul Stavell, who's the, um, the founder of Octopus, he wrote a complete walkthrough of how you can use this to build up your, um, uh, sorry, to use uh, DSC to have essentially infrastructure as code and um, do that whole proper DevOps of spinning machines up on demand. So the, the short version of what happens is you have a project in Octopus Deploy which just has a DSC script in it. So the desired state configuration for the machines that you want to deploy to. So that project exists. It doesn't actually deploy any code. It just runs those scripts. You then have a machine policy like the one that we had to detect drift. And you can just use test DSC configuration just to make sure that that DSC is still, um, still applying to that machine. And then you can use the deployment trigger just to reapply that DSC script. <coughs> so you can tie all those things together, essentially. In fact, you could even go a little bit further and have that health check trigger the deployment trigger uh, to reapply the DSC. And then at the end of that process, trigger a new deployment to that machine using the Octopus API. So if you ultimately, it means that if a machine drifts away from its desired state, a trigger will mean that it gets brought back in line with DSC. And then another project will fire to redeploy the application just in case something's gone wrong there. <coughs> Excuse me. So I yeah, if if that interests you, I'd highly recommend looking through that um, through that blog post. <coughs> Excuse me. So you got water there? I do. I was trying to find a mute button somewhere, which didn't require me to uh, to do that, but <laughs> it'll work. Cool. So that's that's basically yeah the. Uh, all that I was going to show you, so the, the Octopus and PowerShell stuff works really well here, both with actually deploying um, the software across the environments, but also um, configuring machines if you want to do that with DSC, so spinning them up on demand. Uh, so recap, just what I showed you. Uh, we ran through a demo of Octopus just by checking in code and seeing it deploy all the way through. Um, the ways to use scripts inside the project and then by convention. Um, inside your application itself, inside your code. Um, have a look at the script console, which is that kind of command and control function that you can do with Octopus across a fleet of servers um, if that tentacle is installed. Um, and then using health checks and DSC and things like that to repair machines when they're, um, when they're not working properly or to identify problems before they, before they cause problems um, with your applications. Cool. And that is all I had. So thank you. That was cool that you made a demo uh, slide deck out of the console. That was pretty cool, dude. I wonder if I spent too much time on that, to be honest. You, you, uh, who knows? But that was cool. You have to share your code for that. Yeah, I will. I can I'll upload the slide deck. It's just a awesome. slide deck. You make it. Uh, it's literally, uh, did you say, how did I make it? Yeah, how do you make it? Uh, PowerPoint. Oh, uh, nice. Yeah. No. Um, it was actually was uh, I thought it was actual the actual console. <laughs> no, it's not even, uh, it's not even, look, there's even a blink. Um, I'm, I'm spoiling everything now, but there's even a, a blink effect on the underscore. So, oh, nice. Um, I'm not that. Uh, well, <laughs> you got on PowerPoint, huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's nice, dude. 
<laughs> cool. Well, yeah, that's uh, the themes there. I'll, I'll send it to you. That should be good. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, anybody else? Uh, I'll open the floor for questions. Anybody? Do you have his contact information? Yes. Yeah, you did. Um, uh, let me just. I'll, um, oh, I'm in the wrong slide deck. Let me do this. Work. Can you see that? Oh my god, with this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I zoomed in. Ah. He is on he is on the YouTube channel that we have, so yeah, if you want to review this, it, it should be there. No. We can all hear our voices on there, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Whether we want I, to or not. I hope so. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? So um, w one thing I might mention, if you do want to play with this, uh, there is a um, demo.octopus.com um, website that's new as well, the animation. It's probably the coolest thing about it at the moment. Um, <laughs> that was my question. Do you have a um, download, like the trial download? Yeah, free for the first five yep. years. Free for the first five years. So um, it's a 45-day trial, but... Uh, and that's just an unlimited users, unlimited um, projects, and so on. But if you're if you're using that limit inside 45 days, then I'd be in extremely impressed. Um, the community version, which is unrestricted really in terms of functionality, it's just five users, five projects, and 10 deployment targets, which is actually worked out as just 20 things. So if you're the only user. You could have uh, un like one user, one project. You could have eighteen deployment targets if you want, without um, without that license. So the um, the benefit of that, I think, is that it means that it's pretty easy to put together a proof of concept and see if it actually works for you. Um, and we hope that it does. But if it doesn't, you haven't put any money down. So um, you know, give it a shot. But if you just want to play around with what Octopus looks like, demo.octopus.com lets you sign in as a guest and you can click around and do pretty much anything that I've done, um, except that it is read-only for the guest user. So you can come all the way up to actually writing, like adding a step to the process. Uh, but then when you save it, it's going to say you don't have permission to save. But you can click around. You can see exactly what's in Octopus. You can watch it running. We have scheduled deployments. Um, so you can explore that way. The enterprise one, is there a, a, a free trial that, that will give me all the features I can look at? Yeah, the, the, all of the versions are exactly the same. So there's no feature restriction based on the licensing at all. So the community edition can do absolutely everything that the enterprise edition can do, except you're restricted to the number of users, projects, and um, deployment targets. That's fine. All right. Yeah. Are those restrictions at, at one time? Or, you know, for example, say you have a small organization and you're doing multiple projects over this conversation five years? Yep. The, um, so you're... Under the license, you're actually allowed to install three Octopus instances. Um, so if you have completely independent uh, development teams, for example, they might decide to have their own Octopus instance. We have, we have a bunch of consultants, actually, who use Octopus um, pretty much with all of the projects that they go and work on. And so when they go to a client, they will download Octopus for that client and install it and have their one project running in that Octopus server. And then when they go to a different client, they'll download it, download it again for that client and so on. So a lot of our consultants never hit this, um, this limit where they have to pay for it, which is probably not good for us, but it's good for them. Um, yeah, the, the actual restriction on those limits will occur when you try to do a deployment too. So you could, you could create a community, or you could use a community one um, and have 50 projects and, you know, 50 users and so on. But when you do a deployment, it's going to stop you and say your license doesn't let you do that. Um, but, yeah, you can install it three times. Uh, and if you have completely independent um, 
development teams or, or or branches or offices and so on they might decide to have their own octopus project and so that restriction really only is per instance does that make sense i was rambling a little bit there anybody else well damien we thanks we thank you very much i'm not sure what time it is up there what is it almost 10 almost 10. uh yeah about 9 40. we have time to go have a beer right yeah well i've actually uh now i need to turn my screen sharing off there we go i've actually got wine here but i haven't had much of it so yeah. well cheers mate yeah thank you <laughs> yeah, th <laughs> thanks very much for having me um and yes if you think of any questions later on uh feel free to hit me up on twitter or on email um yeah and if you yeah, if you have a play with it and have any suggestions, please let me know.